This talk is going to be about beaver dam analogs, one of the structure types that we're going to talk a lot about this week. Little reminder of where we've been. We talked about the background, sort of the history of low-tech process-based restoration. We described a few other low-tech approaches to be aware of, things we won't cover during this course, but still are important to the restoration and health of river skates. We were recently introduced to post-assisted log structures, and now we are going to give a short introduction of beaver dam analogs. It's important to always keep our minds, you know, on what we're really trying to do out here when we talk about restoration. When we talk about process-based, well, we should keep those processes in mind. And so, whether by using post-assisted log structures or by using beaver dam analogs, we're trying to restore by mimicking, promoting, and sustaining processes of wood accumulation and beaver dam activity. We don't want to lose sight of that because the long-term health of these is dependent upon more than a single treatment where we build a number of structures, but it really does depend on a self-sustaining process, those two processes being dam activity and wood accumulation. To sort of to start describing beaver dam analogs, we should talk you know, a little bit about some of the similarities and differences between PALs and BDAs. Um, both are hand-built structures, uh, both require woody material, and right about there we start to see some divergence. Um, BDAs, unlike PALs, are always built to be channel spanning. With PALs, we sometimes build them bank attached, mid-channel, or channel spanning. BDAs, by contrast, always span the channel. And the reason they do that, of course, is because they need to form a pond. That They're mimicking beaver dams. In order to form that pond, they also use some amount of fill material, sediment that's usually locally taken from bed, banks, or the floodplain, to reduce the porosity. That's not to say these are impermeable structures, but they need to be, have a low enough permeability that they can form an upstream pond. Other differences include that BDAs have a uniform crest elevation. And what I mean by that is the height of the BDA is the same across the channel. And what that ensures is that flow spills equally over the structure during higher flow conditions. Rather than concentrating where it would have more erosive power, it spills uniformly. Uh, the last thing you'll see in these two photos is that while PALs sort of are mimicking large wood and therefore using larger wood, BDAs tend, not, all, not always, but tend to use a slightly smaller diameter material. And so here are some examples of what that looks like on the ground. Um, we can see that BDAs are coming in different shapes and sizes. Um, they might use posts for additional temporary stability. They can be built using willow or juniper or sagebrush. They can be built in slightly in size settings, as shown in the top left, or in areas with really easily accessible floodplain, as shown in the bottom right. There's no one right way to do this. We're going to cover some of those design considerations about where to put structures, what heights, widths you might think of building them at, in the design section of the course. Um, but for now, we're just trying to give you a, a more expansive view of what these structures really look like. Here are four more photos illustrating the same point. We can see places where the BDA is forming both a pond and spilling out onto the floodplain, or areas where it's just simply forcing a backwater. Um, similar to the previous photos, these structures, some of these structures include posts, some do not. Um, they utilize both willow, sagebrush, and juniper. And they're built, built in a sort of range of settings, you know, and that's that range of settings is in some a lot of ways really what's driving some of these other considerations about to use posts or not to use posts, what materials you build with, what you're hoping to achieve with a beaver dam analog. If we're going to talk about, you know, what the goals of mimicking beaver dam activity are, we should probably talk a little bit about what beaver dams do. And we'll hear more about this during a later talk. But for now, let's limit it to some of the sort of really common links or restoration objectives we hear, which is the you know, formation of ponds or deep water habitat. It could be for either you know, native fish, other aquatic species, or for beaver translocation. Um, we can use BDAs to increase channel floodplain connectivity, even during low flow conditions, which in itself can be responsible for helping to recharge groundwater or promote the expansion of riparian areas. And Forcing upstream ponding is going to diversify the range of flow conditions we have, meaning the depths and velocities of flow, which have both you know, important implications for both in-stream and riparian species. 
How do we do that is something we're going to cover a little bit later during the implementation. Don't worry, we'll get there. Um, if you're interested now, it's on pages 35 to 48 of your pocket guide. I think it's helpful to sort of trace some of the evolution of thought over the last you know, decade or so with respect to BDAs to see how we've taken different cues from the landscapes we've worked in to make this practice more efficient across a range of landscapes. And so in effect, how did we go from the photo you see on the left to the range of photos we see on the right? And why did we make some of these decisions? What's behind it? And so BDAs didn't necessarily start as BDAs. They started as reinforcing natural beaver dams in a system where evidence had shown that dams tended to blow out or breach on an annual or two year time frame, which was necessarily limiting the benefits they could provide. And so the first step really was simply reinforcing those dams with posts to increase their persistence. Moving on from that, um, we started building our own dams, beaver dam analogs, and something we'll refer to here as the, as the wicker weave, the post line wicker weave. So because we are in a system where the longevity of structures was a concern, we were using posts when we built these. And we wove willow between the two. And you've probably all seen some structures that look a lot like this. What you can see here is it's doing a great job forcing flows over bank. It's doing a great job forcing an upstream pond. Other things you'll notice, though, are that the flow is cascading over the top. And while it is pretty uniform, it's pouring directly down and plunging, which is likely contributing to scour on the downstream side, which can undermine the structure itself. And so we'll talk about sort of how we decided to, to deal with that in the next slide. Um, oh, sorry, not the next slide, two slides. If we were to look at schematics of this, what we see are that these structures tend to be really narrow. You know, they're just a line of posts and the willow woven between them. You can see this nice basket sort of configuration in the cross-section profile. And this tends to lead to a really strong structure in some ways, but also a structure that, because it's so strongly linked, has the tendency to breach when it breaches to open like a barn door and you know swing open effectively undermining the structure in a way that might not happen if the structure weren't so strongly linked together. Moving on to sort of iteration two, we began incorporating what we refer to as the mattress, which is those downstream sticks oriented parallel to flow so that break flow up as it comes over the top of the structure. And as a reminder, this cue comes directly from natural beaver dams, shown in the upper right. All of those, you know, when you look at the profile of a natural beaver dam, it's not very wall-like. It's much more, you know, triangular or pyramid-like. And so we began to do the same thing, incorporating willow, generally, onto the downstream side to break those flows up as they come over the top. The willow weave is still dominant here, um, so still vulnerable to that same sort of barn door swinging open. Um, but it did help limit the scour on the downstream side. Moving forward again, um, what pops out of here are a couple of things. One, it looks a lot messier. We're not nearly as sort of concerned or uh, spending as much time with a perfect willow weave. We're really just getting that material in there because there's a lot of strength in making these structures as, in some ways, messy as possible. You also notice that while these still use posts, they're incorporating a wider range of material sizes. And that comes from the experience of working in places that didn't have willow, that didn't have this perfect material for weaving. It's pretty hard to weave a six inch diameter aspen. And so our response was, or our trial really, was to incorporate larger material. What changed? Well, we relied a little less on the weave. We were able to incorporate larger material and we still worked on that mattress, and we still are forming that upstream pond, but this is opening up some doors in terms of where we might be able to work. And similar to the previous slide where we started incorporating mattresses, we took some of our cues from natural beaver dams. If you look at the range of material sizes in natural beaver dams, they're not only willow, they're really based on simply what's available in the area. And that could incorporate certainly lots of willow, a smaller diameter, but also aspen trees up to, you know, eight, 10 inches in diameter. Uh, finally, we got around to the realization that natural beaver dams don't have posts in them and that maybe we don't need posts either. Certainly in the sort of earlier stages where we were working did require that we use posts, 
But as we expanded where the sort of settings we were working in into even smaller creeks, um, maybe lower stream power creeks, we realized that we didn't need posts in order to have structures that were going to be stable for long enough to capture some of the benefits we were interested in. And so this did require some differences in construction. It doesn't mean that postless structures are better structures, uh, but it does mean that we are starting to maybe get a little more in tune with the landscape and the streams we were working in to really fit the type of BDAs we were building to the streams we were working in. And so looking at those in a schematic, we see, well, pretty much what you saw earlier, except for no posts. It is worth noting in the profile, however, that it's a much broader base at the bottom. And so when we build these, it is a little bit different than if you were to pound posts and simply weave willow between. It's more of a sort of layered approach to construction, something we'll cover, cover later. It's also important to note that you can build the structure without posts and then put posts in afterwards. Um, Again, we'll cover some of the implementation order of operations a little bit later. To summarize, BDAs, they force upstream ponding. They come in a range of sizes, shapes, and materials. There's no one correct way to build a BDA. There are trade-offs and things we should be aware of. We'll talk more about those in the design and implementation phases. Um, they simply put, use woody material and some amount of sediment, some amount of fill material to reduce porosity. And generally we use these to create deep water habitat for either fish or often to facilitate beaver translocation. And they are really good at increasing channel floodplain connectivity, even during base flow conditions. More broadly, to wrap all of this up, the, all of these low-tech approaches we've discussed are simple, they're cost-effective, and they're process-based. They're designed to mimic and promote process. And importantly, they can scale up to the scope of the problem that we discussed earlier. The little tips and tricks about what type of structure to use, what construction method to use, whether to use willow or juniper while building, all of those will help increase the efficiencies which will enable us to build over larger spatial scales. But broadly speaking, these approaches can be implemented in a wide range of weightable streams.